Welcome to the podcast, Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite. I'm Dr. Laura Socola, your host, founder of Vocal Impact Productions, and author of Speaking to Influence, Mastering Your Leadership Voice. My guest today is Brian Scudamore. Brian is founder of O2E Brands, O2E as in Ordinary to Exceptional, which is the parent company of companies like 1-800-GOT-JUNK, as well as Shack Shine and Wow One Day Painting. He's also the author of the book, and I love this title, WTF, as in Willing to Fail. Brian, thank you so much for joining me today. Thanks, Laura. Nice to be here. Now, let me ask you a question before we get into the official interview flow of sorts. When I looked at your LinkedIn profile, there's a lot of good stuff in there, but there was one thing that jumped out at me in particular. Hmm. Kindergarten. You specifically listed it in your education section of your profile with the caption, and I quote, the only school of 14 attended that I graduated from. Care to elaborate? Yeah, just having some fun with my education component. People like to list a resume of all the schools they've gone to, and sure. I've, gone to a, I've gone to many, but I haven't graduated from many. I failed out of grade school, talked my way into college, went to several colleges, and never finished. I'm a true entrepreneur. You look at people like uh, Bill Gates, uh, Mark Zuckerberg. I mean, you, you get entrepreneurs that drop out of college because as an entrepreneur, you learn more often by doing than studying in school. Sure. I, I just love the way that you specified that, that that's, that's the highest level of graduation specifically out of 14 schools. That was great. That's, that's completely all I've got. My eye. So, and yet it's not all you've got because of how much you've accomplished otherwise. You know, there's lots of people who have truckloads of pieces of paper with school names on them and not a whole lot else to show for it. So that's exactly where I want to look today. So thank you for being willing to share some of the story with the rest of our listeners. Yeah, I think it depends on the profession you're in. My father is a liver transplant surgeon. So yes. he's got accreditations everywhere. You know, if, God forbid someone needs a surgeon, you want to know they're properly trained with an entrepreneur. It's a little bit different. Yes. The, the fail hard, fail fast mantra works a lot better in certain kinds of entrepreneurship, not so much in liver transplant surgery. I think you're right. Absolutely. <laughs> so rule number one, lesson number one, know your market, know your audience and what their tolerance is. That's a, yeah, words to True. live by, literally to live by in that case, I would think. So. Exactly. All right, so let's talk about your world in your O2E brands, in 1-800-GOT-JUNK, or any other mm -hmm. of the various companies that you've established. Where you are now, who do you need to influence? Well, if I, it's, if I think of who I need to influence, it's why do I want to influence anyone? Okay. When I think of the word influence, sometimes I feel like it could sound like it's manipulating someone. It's like a magic trick. It's like if I influence that person to do what I want, to me, the way I look at influence is how can we do something bigger and better together? If I look at myself and who would I want to influence, other entrepreneurs, both in our business and outside. I talked to a young 22-year-old kid today who's building a mobile detailing business, uh, car detailing, and he reached out and wanted to connect. And I'm happy to give the time because I want to see people grow and, and evolve and live their own dreams. So franchise partners, the ones I think that we probably like to have the most influence over is saying, what are your goals and ambitions as an entrepreneur starting a business with any one of our brands? And then how, how can we help you be successful? Yes. And I think you brought up a really important point, which is that the concept of influence, it is not a dirty word. It's a big umbrella category in many ways. But, uh, and this is, I think, page like five or six of my book in particular is, is mm. specifying the difference between the two because influence, there's manipulation and there's mm. persuasion and there's other mm. things. Influence, you can give somebody a look and compel them to go do something as a result of it. It doesn't have to be strong arming them. It doesn't have to no. be, I think manipulation has that sense of, even though I know what you want and what you think you need, I don't care. And I will bend mm -hmm. your will to meet mine despite mm -hmm. the rest. Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. we are definitely staying away from anything in that camp. It's, it's much more about what you were describing as far as I'm concerned. And that's the only kind of influence that I even want to touch with the 10 foot pole is that, you know, how can we build something together? How can we, uh, how can you help people to see what you'd like them to see and see what I they agree. want you to see too? So thank mm -hmm. you for it that springboard. Yeah, no, it's, it, it <laughs> doesn't have to be a bad word. I agree. It is one in when used in the right spirit, 
for everyone to get what they want and what they want to build together, there's huge power in influencing each other. And I think it can be mutual versus as some people might see it as a one way street. Well, and influence is a tool to me, and it's it's like any tool out there, including the internet, for example, it can be used for good or it can be used for evil. And mm-hmm. I'm not interested in talking to people who are going to use it for evil, nor do I want to teach anyone to to apply it in those kinds of contexts. It's about mm-hmm. building something for that greater good, like you mentioned. So. Mm-hmm. With regard to expanding that kind of influence that you and I are both looking for, what kind of specific communication skills did you have to learn in order to build your empire the way that you have? Mm -hmm. Well, it took me a period of about eight years to get to a million in revenue with my little junk removal business, which at the time was called the Rubbish Boys. It's now 1-800-GOT-JUNK and we're building something bigger. And I think when I, if I look back, the number one tool that I discovered Nobody taught this to me. I just realized it as a bit of a tool was developing a painted picture, a vision of where we were going to go. And I remember I sat on my parents' dock at their summer cottage eight years into my business, feeling like I was in a bit of a doom loop, not enjoying my business as much, not feeling like there was a lot of potential with it. And I pulled out a sheet of paper and decided to dream. And I said, what could the future look, feel, and act like at a point in the future five years ahead? And I said, we'd be on the Oprah Winfrey show. We'd be the FedEx of junk removal. We would be in the top 30 cities in North America. And what was interesting was this painted picture tool became one of influence. It became a way for me to share this painted picture, one page, double-sided, with people around me, current employees, future employees, friends and family. And those who got excited and found that their eyes lit up and sparkled over what my vision was, it had influence over them and over us to say, wow, what a great communication tool. And again, I think I discovered it by accident. You know, successful people often have a clear vision, but this came out of a moment of doom where I felt like I just needed to find a better way. What did that way look like? I love those accidental moments of clarity that that lead you into a completely different path. Uh, It's almost like you created a vision board for yourself. It was a vision board in words. And what I love about my kids have often built vision boards. Mm -hmm. But what I love about not having an actual visual picture of what the things we want or the places we want to go look like, if it's just written in words, it allows the audience, potential franchise partners, employees in my company to look at it and have their own picture in their own head. Mm -hmm. And it becomes more real for them. And so we've stayed away from actual pictures in a painted picture. It's all about words and sort of describing what the future will look like. And let it look like whatever people want it to look like for their own personal future dream. Yeah. When people work with O2E brands, they're building their own business or they're helping to support entrepreneurs. I want them to see themselves in that picture. And if I give them an actual picture that they don't really identify with, um, they're not going to see themselves there. And uh, when you talk about influence, it's that idea that will influence that northern, that north star of where you're going. If people can see that picture clearly, it it just, it's planted in your brain and never leaves. So that's an example of a, of a positive influence and a a successful communications tool, skill, call it what you will, that you've been able to apply. Mm -hmm. What's an example of a mistake you've made along those lines, a lesson you had to learn the hard way or a a do-over that you wish you could have? Mm -hmm. So five years into my business, 1994, we were a half a million in revenue, had five trucks, I had 11 employees and I made a a bold, tough decision. I realized that they say one bad apple spoils a whole bunch. Mm -hmm. I had what I thought were nine bad apples. Wow. And I thought, "Ah, I got to start again here. It's the only option that I felt was realistic was firing my whole team. Wow. I had 11 employees that I brought in one morning and I started with two words. I'm sorry. As a leader... I felt accountable to not finding the right people, treating them right, giving them the love and the support that they needed to be successful. I own that as a do-over. That would have been a great one. And I let everybody go. And I said, I I really didn't find the right people. And this doesn't fit with the company, the happy, optimistic company I see myself building. And I started again. And uh, I got a bit of a do-over because I built an amazing culture where we're incredibly proud of what we built today, but it stemmed out of a failure, a WTF moment of being able to learn from a big, big mistake. 
So would you say that the lesson from there that everybody else can take is as you're hiring, it's not just about hiring skills, but be very clear in the vision and the culture that you want to establish for your company and make sure that they want to be a part of that too. Yeah, be intentional with the people you bring into your organization. The people we have are the right people for us. It doesn't make them necessarily the right people for all other companies. It's We have something special about our open office environment, our compelling vision and, and challenging the status quo and where we're going. And when we find that people come into our business with a connection culturally to us, the fun, joking around kind of culture we have, lighthearted, they're more likely to stay long-term and help us build something special. Now you've built a number, uh, you are the, the quintessential serial entrepreneur, the, the mindset as well as clearly the, the list of companies that you've built already. What's next for you or for your current enterprise? We have three brands now under the O2E Brands umbrella. I'm sure we'll have more one day. It's finding the right brand and the right timing. And then finding great people that want to be a part of that next brand, that next story. But nothing, if I think of what motivates me beyond my family, uh, nothing motivates me more in this world than seeing entrepreneurs grow, than watching someone come in who goes, I've always dreamt of being my own entrepreneur, my own business uh, owner, and I've never really had the idea, but I, I never thought about franchising. Then I realized you guys have a proven recipe they join our system, our family, and build something with less chance of failure, less chance of making the mistakes because we've made them all. So what's next? More, more of the same. Different brands, but within that same structure of building happy, people-first companies. And what kind of communication skills do you think you'll need to teach them as you bring on more people into the franchise? Mm -hmm. So I think it's about listening. I think as leaders and as human beings, we can do a much better job listening, myself very much included. It's going to be life, uh, lifelong learning for me to listen. But I think it's asking questions of, of our people, whether employees or franchise owners, what do they want? What are they here for? What are they trying to accomplish with their business? And finding more great people that can really understand that you you have to seek to understand rather than being understood. And I think it's a new leadership model that, you know, not that we invented by any means, but we're trying to adopt and, and it works. If people feel it's one of the most engaging uh, measures of success, I think in a company is how well do people feel that you take their considerations into account? Do you listen? Do you care? Are they there for reasons more than just a job? Absolutely. So ask questions and listen. So perhaps that brings us to us where you're going to take the next question as well, which is bringing us to our listener 24 hour influence challenge. This is your mm. opportunity, Brian, to speak directly to the listeners and mm. challenge them with one step that you want everybody to take one action in the next 24 hours to help themselves mm. have more influence, the positive kind, of course. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What would that be? I don't think you can influence someone until you've got their heart, until you understand what drives them. Okay. So my 24 hour challenge would be someone you are connecting with, a family member, a child, a, an employee, is to ask them a compelling question like, what, what drives you? What are you here for? What do you wanna accomplish in your life? And then zip your mouth. You know, After you've asked the question, give it five minutes of just letting them talk. And then ask more questions help them uncover what's already inside them. And uh, they will be grateful. You'll be grateful for listening. And uh, I think it's a big challenge. All right, everybody, you have your marching orders. Find someone who you need to get to know a little bit better and just ask questions and let them talk and pay attention to what they say. Don't just sit there and watch your clock. Say, all right, Brian said five minutes. Timer's ticking. Okay, when they're done, what about? Nope, pay attention, listen and probe a little bit more from there. Section two of our interview is less about your development of your companies and more about how you guide others on their journey. So succession planning, career advancement, and perhaps it is for you more about selecting the right franchisees. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about for the moment the concept of executive presence, otherwise known mm -hmm. as command presence or leadership presence, that X factor that helps you mm -hmm. recognize a leader. How do you recognize it? 
how would you define it or how would you evaluate it in others? It's a tough one. It, it's, I'm a real gut feel person. Okay. And so often I trust my gut and I, I think it's like a great wine. Leadership presence is sometimes a little hard to describe, but you know it when you see it, when you taste it. For me, leadership presence is somebody that you want to follow. Leadership to me is not leadership if nobody's following. Anyone can say, hey, I'm a leader, but if no one's behind you following, going the same direction with you, I don't believe you're truly a leader. So I think part of leadership is having that presence, having that respect that you, you just want to give to that person that they've earned by the way they show up. Do they do what they say they will do? Are they on time? Are they reliable? Do they keep their word? Do they have their integrity? And so I think that I've often seen leaders where we do what's called the beer and barbecue test in getting to know our franchise owners or even our employees. We'll ask ourselves the question, would we have a beer with this person? Do we see that they're interested and interesting? Do they have a shared passion? And then we'll also look at how the barbecue question is, how would they fit at a company barbecue? Do they have fun? Do they fit? We're not looking for all introverts and extroverts. It's a, it's a mix. It's diverse. But we're looking for people that just fit. So the beer and barbecue test, do they, do they pass that test? A lot of it is, do they have that presence? Do they have the values that we're looking for? And do they show up in a way that makes people want to follow? That's the key to me, that leadership is an image. And, and it's not just about having the position on the org chart that tells people they have to follow you. Do they mm -hmm. want to? Would they, mm -hmm. even if they didn't have to? I love that you made that, that real specific clarification. I think that's a, a critical piece. Now, yeah, follower, followership is a choice. Yes. Right? People, you, you look at politicians, you look at religious leaders, you look at business leaders, it doesn't matter. People are making a choice whether or not to follow. And we can look at, you know, many examples, I'm sure that we all are aware of in current news in the world where people aren't following other people or where they are following people because of the choices they're making. Yes. Yes. So how can people, and this is a question out to the listeners, think about it. What makes people want to follow you versus just have to? Mm -hmm. And with regard to succession planning, when you're grooming a high potential employee or perhaps looking to hire someone from outside the organization for a leadership role, what are some of the communication skills you look for? Great question. So we did a little walk and talk today we went out with somebody who was at the final stages of, of interviews. And in today's world where everything is happening through Zoom, we really wanted to get out one of my key executives and I to go for a social distance walk with this one person as a CFO. And really we asked ourselves on that, on that walk, what are we looking for here? And so much of it is connection. Do you trust that person's communication style? The, you know, I think a buzzword these days is transparency. Sure. People want to show up and be authentic. Hard to measure at times. And sometimes it's, again, back to your gut. Do you just trust that this person has the right intentions? Are they being forthcoming? And one of the best things about my walk this morning is the candidate ad admitted to a bit of a mistake and a failure in their world. And to me, when people are able to be vulnerable, and it, that helps to build trust. So I think communication I am looking for in key people at any level of the business, really, is are they real? Are they putting on a show or are they just being themselves and they're not afraid to do so? There you go. Then what's the flip side? What's the red flag that you might see or hear that would be the derailer that would go, oh, no, on second thought, hiring slash promotion, maybe not such a good idea. Mm -hmm. I think people that often talk too much where they, and they can be nervous in an interview and there's reasons why that might happen. But I think somebody that doesn't ask enough questions can be a derailer. Are they really interested in your business and your company versus all the other choices they can make? Um, are they trying to just sell you on themselves? Or are they, do they have the leadership skills required to ask questions and listen? Do they wanna learn more about your business and your vision and how they can play a part? That I think is incredibly powerful. So the red flag is somebody that's just talking too, too, uh, talking too much, small ears syndrome. <laughs> I never heard it referred to that way, but I like that. I'm going to steal that. Did you make that one up or did you hear it someplace else? I, I heard it somewhere else too. But we, 
but we've often said it to people. It's like, you know, you, you've got uh, two ears, you know, use them. Uh, you've got one mouth, two ears, use it in that proportion, right. right? And people will, sometimes they need to be called on it, myself included. Sometimes I can just go on and on and you got to be careful. That it's, you got to show people you care. And people feel cared about if you if you're asking questions and then you truly, as you said, sit back and pay attention. Like the short arms, deep pockets challenge, except from the listening perspective of things. Exactly. Exactly. Then what about managing up? This is what I like to refer to as my pet peeve question. When your direct reports, or for that matter, indirect reports, have to present information to you, they come to you with something, what do you wish they would do differently more often than not? Mm -hmm. I wish they'd be vulnerable. I wish they would own up to a piece of information they couldn't find or a challenge they're facing that they need help with that they don't know how to solve. I wish that they would just own up and, and share some weaknesses and vulnerabilities and say, I haven't figured this part out. Do you have any ideas? I think often uh, when I've been managed up, people will often come to me and they think that I expect them to have all the answers. I don't. And when they try to pretend they've got all the answers, it's inauthentic. It doesn't feel real. And my spidey senses go off going, ah, oh, something's not right here. And I don't trust this person. So I wish people managing up would just be real and say it like it is. Which is not to say just, hey, boss, I'm a mess. Fix my problems for me. But true. nevertheless, to, to be more transparent in that. Okay. Be more transparent. And everyone knows that people don't have all the answers. So when you don't have the answers, say so. And, uh, you know, we, we're going through some challenges in the company right now, as I think all companies are. Um, there's a lot of talk of um, uh, diversity and inclusion and great conversations. As a company, we're getting a lot of pressure from some employees who are very passionate about this topic. We don't have all the answers. You know, we hardly have any answers, but we're willing to listen and learn. And so if we try to come out and say, hey, we've got this figured out, people won't buy it because they know we don't have it figured out. So be open, be transparent and say it like it is. Well, that brings us then to the speed round, which is the final seg segment of the interview. And these are some of the most common themes and challenges that arise when I'm working with clients, either with training teams or one-on-one -on -one coaching, even in speaking engagements, people raise these issues because they tend to see them erroneously as black and white, either mm -hmm. or, and they often struggle thinking, oh my gosh, I'm the only one who suffers from this. I'm the only mm -hmm. one who wrestles with these issues. So this is where I want us to do some myth busting and let people know that it's not just that people who are already at the top were born perfect and have no problems and don't wrestle with these things, how, but it's a chance to show them what's possible and let them know what is, what's a little bit behind the curtain. We're going to take a peek. Mm -hmm. So first, in a single word or phrase, I'm going to give you some of these binary, these false binary choices and ask you where you land on them. And then mm -hmm. I'll prompt you with a follow-up for a little bit more uh, advice from there. First, public speaking. Love it or hate it? I used to hate it. Uh, I used to be terrified of it in school and I would avoid any presentation whatsoever. Uh, I just, it terrified me. I, do I love it now? I love the impact it can make when I've done a good job. It's, I still get nervous, but it's this much versus just going, oh my gosh, I got, I'm going to die here. <laughs> Okay, so what's an, then how did you get over that fear? Because I think there's a lot of it, the piece that you mm. said at the end with regard to I don't like doing it necessarily, but I love the mm. impact it has. Apparently, that's mm. how I feel about running. I hate running, but I love having run. I like being done mm. running. Mm -hmm. So how mm -hmm. do you get through that? What's, what's a, uh, a tip that you can give the audience with regard to how they can manage nerves and speak with confidence mm. when those butterflies can get a little overwhelming? Mm -hmm. Well, I had, I'd been asked years ago, five years into my business, as things were getting successful, to come speak to another group of other young entrepreneurs. And I think there were three or 400 of them. And I said yes in the moment. And then I was like, oh, gosh, what did I just say yes to? And it was about two weeks of me just sweating bullets and going, ah, this is going to be awful. But I threw myself into it. And once I did it, I was like, okay, you know what? It was hard in the beginning, but it wasn't that bad. And I got a bit of a taste for it and then a desire to want to improve over time. And now I enjoy it. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it, it's not as nerve wracking again. Do I love it? Do I want to be on the platform all the time? Absolutely not. But uh, I feel like I'm adding value, which feels good. 
And that's a great challenge to, to look at yourself for the notion of, I, I don't know if there's anybody out there who hasn't felt it at some point, but if not, you need to find an opportunity to stretch the, that moment when you commit to something and then you go, oh my God, what did I just agree to do? Mm-hmm. Whether it's yeah. for a client or for a boss or for a family member, you go, oh, okay, how am I going to do this? Uh, that's, that's a great place to be. It's terrifying in the moment, but boy, the, the creativity that you can come up with if you really put your mind to it, I think is empowering. It is. And, and what's the worst that can happen? I was speaking to a couple of thousand people and I've tried to now take my story and instead of having PowerPoint or any cards or anything, whatever my speech might be or my talk, I commit it to memory. And I've got some visual mnemonic devices that help me. And I remember I was up in front of a couple of thousand people uh, about a couple of years ago and I lost my train of thought and it went I just completely blank on stage. And I must've sat there for what felt like an eternity. It might've only been seven or eight seconds. And I fumbled through and panicked. And I'm just like, at the end of it, looking back, I'm like, what's the worst that can happen? If any one of those 2000 people were up speaking, they might've felt the same way, not a big deal. And when people see you struggle for a minute, it can help connect them to you to go, okay, he's a real guy. Yes. Yes, the, the floor is not going to open up and swallow you whole. You might want it to, but it's not going to happen. So there should not be the fear there. Exactly. Now, what about this one? Introvert or extrovert? I'm a little bit of both for sure. I think I'm not quite in the middle. I'm a little more towards the introvert side. Then and what's one related strength of being an introvert or a more introvert than not? Yeah, I think an introvert, when I'm operating in my introverted area, I can get more done, more accomplished, because I can just be focused and I'm getting energy from myself. I think knowing that I'm an introvert has helped me recharge when I need it. I just know if I'm in a situation and I'm a very social person, I think most people would see me who know me through work would say, oh, Brian's a total extrovert. Not at all. I can get out there and enjoy those moments, but I need to retreat and get my energy back by going for a walk or a Peloton or something just to kind of go, okay, I got this. And that's a really critical distinction as well, because I think many people use the word introvert as a more erudite synonym for shy. And it's not about that. It's about where the energy, as you stated, where where you get your energy or what takes energy from you. And knowing that I think is a critical piece, knowing where you where you get yours. Where do you get yours that from that, uh, the Peloton and the exercise piece? Yeah. Exercise is my recharging. It's keeping me healthy. I think I get my energy from watching others do well. So again, back to watching a franchise owner or someone in our office hmm. have a win. I get more watching them win than having my own win. So I, I think I like knowing that I'm a part of the equation, even if it's a tiny little part, that's where I'll get energy. And then I am social. I'm, I'm the prankster around the office. Uh, I'm always making jokes. And even in the Zoom world, I've been good at making some. And that gives me some energy. So I've got the balance. And I'm glad because I enjoy components of both being an introvert and an extrovert. Then what's one related area for growth as a result? Um, an area for growth by being... Meaning so you're not a full introvert or full extrovert. What's something... Often people will say, well, this is what's good about being an introvert. I'm good at mm. this. But as a result, I am not so great at this piece or I need to work more on that. Yeah, I don't, I, I'm very accepting of who I am and where I am on that spectrum. So I think for me, it's just reminding myself to be aware that if I'm in an extroverted situation that is there's too much that I need to escape from, or if I'm being too introverted and need to go back and talk to people, it's just, I think, being more aware. Because at times I can get so focused on my work that I'm not being as social. I'm not getting out and talking to people. And I got to remind myself that sometimes while that can be a little hard, um, I've got to also make that work because that's part of my job as a CEO. Sounds like from time to time, life will pull you too far to one extreme or the other on that continuum and uh, not allow for the balance. And you then need to take the mindful step to come back into the middle for that balance of opportunity. That's exactly it. Exactly. Then finally, what about conflict? Are you hardwired to when, when there's the possibility of conflict or hard conversations, Mm -hmm. does your Mm -hmm. natural wiring just want to avoid or naturally want to just deal with it head on? Yeah, I want to deal with it head on. I mean, I don't think anyone would ever say that I'm, um, 
brash or that I deal with conflict in a non-respectful way. I just, so I don't enjoy the conflict, but I enjoy getting the conflict resolved. So for me, it's, we have something in our office at, at O2E that we actually call race to the conflict. Like we want people to get there quickly and just get in a room and talk about it. And so I just feel like the sooner you can have a conversation and ask questions and listen, the faster you can get to a point of different perspective that that person might have to go, wow, I didn't realize you felt that way. Now I understand why you did this and um, you can get the conflict. You can push it aside and you can learn from what happened and maybe how to avoid it in the future. Then what's the piece of advice you can give others on how to do that if they don't have a race to the conflict as part of their corporate culture? Yeah, I think, I think that discussing things quickly before it festers and gets worse, I think is important. So I would challenge people to, to say, how can they, if they're not racing to the conflict, at least take a first step towards the conflict. How can they, how can they start talking about it a little sooner? And so we've got this WTF willing to fail culture we allow people, we encourage people to make mistakes. So when someone makes a mistake, it's easier for that to become a conversation. Uh, it might be a conflict because it caused some frustration with people because a mistake was made, but it's very accepting to be able to say, so what'd you learn? What would you do differently? No one's getting grilled for making the mistake. It's just, okay, so now what did we learn? How are we gonna avoid this in the future? And I think that's an important part of, of trust building is showing that you can make mistakes and not have it haunt you for the rest of your lives. There's the opportunity to learn from it. So thank you for sharing that. Sure. Now, Brian, how can people learn more about you and OTE? Sure. So they could go to o2ebrands.com and learn about our different brands, the franchise opportunities we have. Uh, they can Google myself, Brian Scudamore, and there's all sorts of different videos and content out there as, as Google is great at, at doing. So yeah, I'd say O2E Brands or any of the social media, LinkedIn, Instagram. And we will share all of those links that you've shared with us. We'll put it on the, on the show notes page so people can find it very easily. Perfect. All right. From there, thank you again so much for having, uh, for having me, for joining me today on the podcast and sharing thank your you. story. Yeah, and a lot of fun. And, and you know, I, I do learn from these. It's fun to have conversations, especially this one being a little different than just telling the business story, but talking about something um, very focused like communication. It's something I'm always trying to get better at and have a long ways to go, but it's, it's fun to talk about. I'm so glad. I'm so glad because we don't want to be just like everybody else out there. And you do have so many more stories to share and so much more insight to give. It's, it's a shame if nobody has the opportunity to tap into it. So I'm glad to be the outlet for you. And if you can think of awesome. others, perhaps we can have a follow-up conversation and share some more. Absolutely. To everybody else out there, thank you for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And don't forget to give us a five-star rating on iTunes so we can help even more people increase their confidence, presence, and influence on video. And finally, if you want to download my quick start guide to mastering the three C's, command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal, go to speakingtoinfluence.com. I'm Dr. Laura Sokola, and you're listening to Speaking to Influence, communication secrets of the C-suite. Hi everyone, this is Dr. Laura Sokola, and I want to sincerely thank you for listening to the Speaking to Influence podcast. If you love listening to these episodes as much as I love bringing them to you, be sure to subscribe so you never miss an episode. And please go to iTunes right now to rate and review our podcast in order to help us expand our reach so even more people can master the three C's to command the room, connect with the audience, and close the deal. Thank you for listening to Speaking to Influence, Communication Secrets of the C-Suite, the show for leaders who want to speak with impact. The hosts, producers, owners, and media distributors of the show make no guarantees that the strategies and information discussed will result in profit or other success and may result in losses. The opinions and statements of the hosts and guests do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the owners, staff, managers, broadcasters, or sponsors of the show. No medical or psychological therapy or personal or professional wellness or relationship advice is offered in the show. You are advised to seek counsel on matters related to your health, family, relationships, job, or other business and legal matters from licensed advisors in those areas prior to making any changes in business or lifestyle. No information provided may be suitable in your situation. As always, take responsibility for the decisions and actions you take, including the reactions they may make in your work, family, health, and life.